Sarah explained the day before yesterday, Sarah was preaching on four noble truths in brief. So among those four noble truths, as Sarah explained, that there a group of former two and a group of latter two. So in the former two, they are of smudya, dukkha satya and smudya satya. That is the truth of suffering and the truth of the cause of suffering, and they are equivalently also termed as vata. And the remaining or the latter two are the these are called vivata satya. These remaining two are not to be walked through your meditation practice. But for the former two, uh, cause of suffering and the suffering, it always exists in each and every one. So that's why we have to walk out through these two, no, two truths. As for the latter two, they belong to Lokotara, that is the supramundane and the former two are within the field of mundane. So as for the supramundane, for the Ariya, or only the noble who have reached to the Ariya, part, Ariya stage, they have these two types of uh, letter, no, two types of noble truth or viveta sekha. And they are also not to be noted. So, Sarah explained, only to the two former parts, that is, Dukkha Sekha and Smudhya Sekha, only these two should be noted. And in brief, Sarah has touched on the day before yesterday. Sarah explained the Vivutta or the Dukkha Sekha to understand more clearly. This Dukkha Satya, or the truth of suffering, is the whole of you. So if you remember like that, it will be easier for you. And for Samudhya Satya, that is the cause of the truth of suffering, is whenever we encounter from the sense of seeing, hearing, smell, etc., because we thought all are pleasurable, so we crave for it, we like it, we attach to it and we cling to it. So, Sarah explained, in a simplest form to understand Dukkha Satya, that is the truth of the suffering is, whenever we uh, focus our mind on the rising and falling, one rising, as we note, this is one Dukkha Satya. One falling, as we note equivalently, it is also Dukkha Satya. So to the present occurrences, if we note, we will come to understand the nature of Dukkha Satya, whether it is uh, rising Dukkha Satya or maybe the falling Dukkha Satya, as we note immediately to these, uh, to these objects, we will come to know. So as expounded by the Lord Buddha, Sarah explained that, to come to understand this Dukkha Satya, we have to focus on these present occurrences and we will come to understand distinctively. Sarah explained, as we note this rising and falling, these ultimate nature or the absolute truths are profound or deep-seated to understand, as well it is very difficult to see. Why it is very difficult to see, Sierra explained that though we are asked to note on the rising and falling of the abdomen, in the beginning we will just see the form of the abdomen that is heaving up and down. And later on we will come to see the manners of the movement. And later on only we will come to stiffness, tension, etc. Only when we come to see the stiffness and tension and at the present moment, then we will come to see Paramatta or the Absolute Truth. When this Paramatta, the ultimate or the Absolute Truth is the real Dukkha Satya, that is the truth of suffering. So before we are able to pick up this stiffness 
tension, etc. Whenever we observe from our noting mind, we will be only seeing pinyaka. That is the conventional truth. Pinyati. That is the conventional truth. Only the conventional truth we will be able to pick up from our mind. And we will be able to see the movement or the manners that is going on in our abdomen. So that's why to be able to see the absolute truth is deep-seated. That's why Sarah says it is profound in nature. For the non-meditators, whenever their mind focus on any object, their mind will only know the conventional form and shape the manner and all the uh, verbal names and all these conventional terms. Only when a person is able to note, then when they are in progress and reach to an attentive state, then they will come to understand the nature of paramatta or absolute truths or ultimate truth. There are some who are in practice, they thought we know Paramatta, the absolute truth, but it is not yet true. So these Dhamma nature, as they are profound or deep-seated, then at what time in our wisdom how we would know? Sarah cited the Pali phrase and Sarah says that only when only when Opposing the man nature are eradicated or they were at distance, then deep seated or the profound nature will reveal to a being. So that means only when your mind is freed from these opposing the man nature, then one would be able to see with one's wisdom of Paramatta or the absolute truth. So, when S explain these opposing demand nature, the opposing demand nature, what are they, Sarah explained, and these are of five. The first kind is called Kamisana Nivarana. Nivarana means they are the hindrances. So, this number one is our craving or desire to all the adorable and lovable objects. That is Kamit Chanda Nivarana. That means from our sense of seeing, hearing, smell, taste, touch, etc. We always like to encounter with all the pleasurable senses. In summarization, all the attractable or lovable objects, we always crave for them. And second, Nivarana or hindrance is called ill will or Gyapada. That ill will is whenever we have to encounter with any negative object, instantly we develop anger, aversion, etc. So mind behavior. Our mind is lethargic and it is lazy and it is clouded with Chinyamita, that is sleepiness and drowsiness. It is not sharp, it is not clever, and we cannot note it properly. So this is the third kind of opposing the man nature or hindrance. And the fourth kind is, whenever we remember of the past uh, unwholesomeness in us or akusala, we regret and we have remorse. And sometimes we remember that we have not yet done all the wholesomeness too, then we regret. So in that way, we develop Odisha and Kokosa, that is, worries and flurries, as the third kind of opposing the man nature. And the fifth kind of opposing the man nature or hindrance is called Vizikesa Nivarna. Vizikesa Nivarna. That is the perplexity or the doubt. Doubt that uh, is this the true Dhamma? Is it the true chi- teaching? Etc. Etc. So in that way, we were having this perplexity as a, another opposing Dhamma nature. 
As for all the beings, except from our sleeping hour, as soon as we wake up, only at the sleeping hour our mind is quiet. As soon as we wake up, then our mind is always covered up with these five different kinds of nivarana or hindrances. So to eradicate these hindrances mean the opposite nature is we need to clean our mind or purify our mind. And we need to develop all the wholesomenesses in our mind, which is to eradicate the covering up or the weak, the opposing demand nature, which is covering your mind and weakening your mind. Because our mind is covered up and weak, weakened with these opposing demand nature, we don't know what is Dukkha Secha, what is the truth of suffering, and we don't know also what is the truth of the cause of the suffering. So, only when we are able to eradicate or free from this opposing demand nature, then when the opposing demand nature are freed, one would be able to see the profound demand nature. How we are able to see the profound demand nature Shara will explain now. The opposing demand nature, they oppose to what kind? They oppose to the purified mind or they oppose to the kusala or the wholesome mind. So Shara explained Nivarana, the hindrance in English means they prevent all the wholesomenesses or they block or they hinder these wholesomenesses not to arise. In other words, they are impure, and because they are impure or dirty, there is no chance to develop purity in one's mind. So whenever the mind is covered up with these hindrances, whatever the nature may be, whether one arises with kamisana, craving to sensual pleasures, or maybe stop and topper at times too, whatever the nature may be, then that mind is covered up with nivarana or hindrances. That's why we do not have the clarity of mind. Why we do not have the clarity of mind mean our mind is covered up with all these opposing demand nature. So as they block not to develop any wholesomeness in mind or clarity of mind, they prevent or they weaken so as not to develop any kind of analytical or differentiative truths of the knowledges. So that's why in the literature, Sarah explained explained, these kind of opposing nature are, they are weakening one's mind. They are making the mind uh, uh, not to be strong. So in that way, they were disparaged. In the line of our consciousness, these ultimate demand nature are very difficult to see as they are deep-seated and as because they are so profound means they are not revealed to your mind. Then when we are able to eradicate these covering up opposing demand nature, then that means one has come to see the profound demand nature or revealing all the truth. So Sierra explained that because this is a hard to see, difficult to see means if these opposing demand nature are able to be eradicated, these profound demand nature, however they are hard to be seen, but if these opposing demand nature are expelled or dispelled, then it will reveal to one. Sierra explained these demand nature or the opposing demand nature are not the materiality as we are using every day. All the materiality that will wean off and they will destroy or they, they rotten or they will decay. But it is not like that. If we are unable to eradicate these opposing demand nature, then they will be piling up in ourselves time and again more and more. So that's why it is important 
to eradicate is with what kind or how are we going to eradicate these opposing demand nature. To these opposing demand nature, first we must do it to weaken and then later to lessen and at one time to be able to exterminate or eradicate. Uh, eradicate. So what, with what kind of practice or with what connective nature when one, one will come to understand the real truth is we need to practice methodically or meticulously or properly. So only with proper practice in connected with these proper practice one will come to understand or the demand nature of the ultimate truth will reveal to you. So Sarah explained even though you and un- we understand the r- real method, how it is methodically we need to practice, but if we do not practice too, we do not come to understand the ultimate truth. So if, in other words, if we don't practice, we won't know these absolute truth at all. So in summarization, that is to come to understand the absolute truth. We must practice methodically as we should do, only connected with this systematic practice. The nature of the absolute truth will reveal to you, so that all these opposing demand nature will become weak and lessen, and at one time we will be able to eradicate. If one doesn't know the right method, or if one knows the method, but if not practiced too, then one cannot understand the truth of the nature. But how are we going to eradicate this opposing demand nature is important. So if we, before this, if we don't study anything, we are ignorant, we don't know anything. So to eradicate, to weaken first, and then in the end to eradicate all these de- opposing demand nature, it is very important to listen, to have the learned knowledge. That is, we must read the books, we must listen from the appropriate teachers, we must discuss about it. So only then we will have a good guidance how we are going to eradicate this Nivarana or how we are going to practice to dispel these hindrances. Only when the knowing is right, then will you come to see the right nature. As in the beginning of the discourse, as Sarah explained, whatever happens in your body, then or in you, then all these are as a whole, we should understand as this is Dukkha Secha, this is is the truth of suffering. Then to come to understand the truth of suffering, we should practice methodically to come to know or to perceive the truth or to come to understand the truth. So if we don't perceive or observe, we don't know at all. But if we observe or or note, we will come to know. So that's why to come to understand the truth means that is the way to dispel new varana or hindrances. To come to understand means, Syara cited the phrase, and that is to observe to all the present occurrences. That is uh, mean, that means we need to have one kind of guardianship in us. That Sarah explained in accordance with our Buddhist teaching or in Buddhist sasana, whomsoever are so afraid to go wrong in the cycle of rebirth and death, then we need to have one guardianship. That one guardian is none other than sati or mindfulness. So 
Sarah says, if he has to say it directly means keep your mind to the present occurrences. These present occurrences mean whenever we see, hear, spell, taste, touch, or rising, falling, uh, lifting, stepping, etc. All these things, if we are mindfully watching or observing, then one could say that this person is staying in with mindfulness or sati. So, as a direct meaning means, we have to observe to all the present occurrences. Although Syara have to say the sati or mindfulness as a leader of a mind quality, though it for this strong mindfulness is, we need to have a right aim. That right aim, Samasinkapa, have the quality of jhana. So with that right aim, we are able to penetrate our mind into the object precisely and properly. But if our noting or observing mind is not concurrent and not penetrating into the object too, then we cannot see it clearly the true nature. So that's why we need to put an energy from our mind. That is called right effort. With the right effort and the right aim, if we are able to note it, then the strong mindfulness or strong awareness will occur. Sarah gave an example like you are eating at a table. So when you want to pick up an, a piece of eatable object, then you need to pierce it with a fork. So before you pierce it with a fork, then you have to aim to that object and with that aim you need to use the effort if although there is an aim but if you are not using the effort then the fork cannot reach to that piece of piece of object so it is important to pick up that edible object not only you should have the aim but you must have the effort to pierce this edible object. So if you want it, then you have to have the right aim as well. You need to have the effort, then you will have that piece of edible object. If you are piercing it not properly too, then it is not piercing to that object. Only when we are having the right effort, then you will be piercing the object. And if that effort you are using is proper, then it will be effective. It, if not, it is not effective. So only when it is able to uh, pierce it properly and thoroughly, then you will get that edible object. So likewise, in, the, in, our, aiming mi in our mindfulness, if we have the right aim and the right effort, then we will have that Power, strong power of sati or mindfulness. When sati or mindfulness is nearer to the object and if it is piercing that object means then you are having a good uh, momentary concentration. It, that guy to have in you is the mindfulness you are focusing on to the object is it is not at a distance. There is no gap. It didn't, it didn't slip off. It is together with the object or it is piercing the object. So that is the time you are having kanika samadhi or momentary concentration. As expressed in the sati or mindfulness, how one to penetrate, although there are many components of mind, the heading or the leader of these mind constituents is the sati or mindfulness. So with this power of sati, then if we are noting or observing, this becomes as a prevention or protection to one's mind. If there is a guard or protection because of that strong mindfulness, it guards you from the opposing demand nature or the hindrances. 
if, if one is able to note for one moment, that moment is the time your mind is guarded or protected. If you are able to note more, for example, for one minute, then for, for within that one minute there are sixty moments, so for sixty moments you are protected. If you are able to note for five minutes, you will have three hundred times or moments are guarded. And if you are able to note for one hour, there are three thousand six hundred times you will be guarded. Once a mind is having this protection or a guard, then there is no chance for the opposing demand nature to seep in. So your mind is safely guarded from the opposing demand nature. If your mind is protected from the opposing demand nature, your mind is freed from these opposing demand nature. At that time, that is called you, are, you have remote or you are freed from these attacks. So at that time you will have calm or composure. Santi. 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 So as your mind is liberated from the opposing demand nature, as you goes on practice long in this meditation field, whenever your mind focus on the object, it couples or it goes together with the object, it pierces the object. So this penetrating or piercing to the object becomes so many times or numerous, then the profound nature of dukkha or the profound nature of suffering will come to reveal to one's mind. So at that moment in Yogi's mind, Although we may be noting the rising and falling of the abdomen, there is no more of the form and shape of your abdomen. You have surpassed the nature of mannerism and you will come to see or observe the stiffness, tension, etc. So in that way, you are understanding the truths of suffering. Okay, Nyana. With the direct noting, because we note properly, as explained, we come to understand. So, what we come to understand is, we come to understand the truth of the suffering. As we come to understand the truth of the suffering, then that is the time. There is no chance in your mind to develop the now craving or grief. So, as soon as you are knowing this um, truth of the suffering as a spontaneous effect then you eradicate samudhya sakya that is the truth of the cause of the suffering at this time though we have to say as a eradicate mean because your mind is guarded and knowing the truism of the suffering then there is no chance for these uh, defilements like greed or craving to seep into your mind. When we come to see Dukkha Satcha or the truths of suffering clearly or vividly, then that is we are attaining this clarity in mind is due to Samma Padipati. That is we are practicing methodically. If we are practicing methodically, then at that time we are abandoning all these greed and craving. That means we are able to abandon me. Actually, we are keeping all these defilements at a distance or we are suppressing at that moment of methodical practice. So, that means, Shara explained, if you don't practice it methodically, you won't come to know the truth. If you practice methodically or systematically, you will come to know the truth. So how we come to know the truth if we practice methodically is through theory and through in, in from practice we will come to know. As for one who is absent in sati and if one is not practicing in a practical manner 
then we are not able to eradicate or we cannot change the line of consciousness from the covering nature of these from the cover up of these opposing the man nature. So if we are able to practice methodically, then only we will be able to substitute in our mind with the purity or purification instead of all the impurities. So when we are noting the rising and falling, or if we are observing with the strong awareness from the seeing, hearing, smell, taste, uh, touch, rising, falling, etc., then if we are strongly and powerfully noting, we will come to see the Dukkha Sacha. But if we are not noting or observing methodically, we are unable or we are not able to see the truth of suffering. But if our noting is weak, or then pinyati, or the conventional terms, or the conventional truth are covering up the absolute truth too, you cannot, you are unable to see the absolute truth as well. That means if you are able to note with strong, powerful mindfulness as guided by, then if you practice methodically, you will come to know the truth. How you will come to know the truth? Sarah explained, even to the minute behavior from your body, for, a, from a, for example, like you are blinking. As you are blinking, the eyelids, the move, there are movements in the eyelids. Before you are closing or opening the eyelids, then there are numerous consciousness are walking out and it is followed as an action of blinking in your eyelids. So all these walk out from your consciousness as well from the blinking from your physical part all are in the nature of Dukkha Satya that is the truth of suffering. So wanted to close your eyelids or wanted to open your eyelids as well all these are the natural walk out from the mind and matter flux and you come to understand the nature of Dukkha Satya or the truth of suffering. To come to understand the truth of the suffering is it is crucial or it is very important to note with the right aim and right effort to be able to pierce to the object concurrently and precisely then you will come to understand the nature of the truth of a suffering. That means, Sarah says, it is very obvious only through the systematic or methodical practice you will come to, this, come to see the truth. To come to see the truth of the suffering or Dukkha Satya, in the former part, before we take up the Dhamma practice, we are having uh, the Samma, Pati Pati. What we have is, we have the morality. Morality as a bhikkhu, the bhikkhus have to observe what they have to observe. As for the lay people, as we have observed the eight precepts, then we have to observe it uh, properly. So as we observe the morality properly, without any breakage, then we are training our bodily behavior and verbal behavior. So if our bodily behavior and verbal behavior are pure and faultless, and if we are able to take up the five kinds of, uh, able to eradicate the five kinds of opposing demand nature, then as we proceed with this practice, then we are able to eradicate from the transgressional type of, uh, of defilements and then to the medium type or the obsessive type of defilements and to the fine or the latent type of defilements all will be suppressed and at one time we are able to eradicate all. So that means if we are able to stay in with this 
describe manner. We are staying for a moment fully in the sasana, in this Buddha sasana. So if we are able to train ourselves as described just now, then we are staying in with oneself sasana. To understand the Dukkha Satya, we need to trodden these three noble stages of the training of sila, training in morality, and training in samadhi or concentration, and training ourselves with dhinya or wisdom. With these three types of training, we are able to eradicate or suppress gross defilements, medium type of defilements, and fine or potential type of defilements. So if we are able to eradicate all these defilements and training ourselves with these three stages of noble training, what would one would be? One becomes pure or purified. If one is pure, then that being becomes civilized. If one is civilized, then that being becomes meek. And if one becomes meek, then he or she is an adorable person. So that, that is the way to each and every second we are training ourselves with sasana to oneself. If we are training ourselves with sasana from second to second, then that is the time not you are having a, a protection to yourself, but at the same time you are not harming or hurting any other people with improper action. So that is the real civilization or making a real sasana in, or building in the real sasana in yourself. So with this type of training means you have conquered yourself. This you have conquered yourself means that is you are not uh, winning on other people or any outside nature, but you have trained yourself to win yourself. That is, with the way of the Ma training, you conquered yourself. So if you are able to train yourself with the Ma training, then you win yourself. So if you are if you are winning yourself, then you are at peace. So in that way, every beings on this earth can win or conquer oneself. How it will be peaceful on this earth? So to train oneself with this training, you will have the real civilization. To accomplish this real civilization and with the good, good training or the uh, noble training in you, how to accomplish is we need to fulfill ourselves with two factors. Number one is we must listen attentively seriously and with due respect to the discourses or to the teaching. And secondly, we must have the due respect and carefully and properly we must practice it. So, first kind is we must listen with due respect and seriously. Then, later on, we have to discuss and then we take up the practice. As we are in the field of practice, we need to practice with due respect, seriously and attentively, so much so that your focusing mind should pierce and couples together onto that object, then you will be seen as you should be. Only if you are noting as precise and as you go on training, you are training yourself to develop the real civilization in yourself. So that means you are conquering yourself or you win yourself. But in the line of your practice, if any factor is lacking or deficient, then you cannot conquer yourself, you are not winning yourself. If you are not winning yourself from any kind of behavior, then you can insult or make any kind of wise behavior. As explained, if one is listened attentively and, and with due respect and practicing properly, then even with one noting how it is beneficial, 
how it is precious, those who have noted or the people who are noted, they come to realize. So in that way, you will come to understand the preciousness of even the one noting, and you know how it will achieve you to attain the real civilization in oneself. So once you have understood this high esteem nature or the preciousness of this Dhamma, you really devote to this Dhamma, you cherish it and you pay very much attention to it. So in that way, from your bodily behavior, etc., in whatever you do or, or you behave, you will be behaving with the noting mind or with the presence of mindfulness. But Shara says the yogi have are in yogis are in this center already for one week. Whenever there's a, a, they dismiss from this meditation hall, they just go back like the school children. That means they are looking here and there with without the presence of mindfulness. That means they are not seriously noting. And we have to remember that if we are noting superficially, then we cannot understand these truths. So that's why we should make a habit to note it seriously. And when we come to understand the preciousness of this Dhamma nature, we really uh, cherish it and we really value it. So these people are the one who knows the benefit of the preciousness of this Dhamma. With each and every moment of noting, they will be noting attentively and with due respect. So to come to understand to this line, Syara come to his end of talk and he says that with this kind of understanding, while you are practicing meditation, may you all be able to practice well to make what while you are staying here.